welcome to Straight Talk with Carly Lissa Thorne. And I have with me once again my dear friend, Corey Jenke. And I love having him with me because we have fun banter. And so today we're going to be talking about leadership and customer service. So he did a wonderful blog post the other day where this manager at a store didn't do quite the right thing. And I'm actually going to turn it over to him because he is going to do an eloquent demonstration of this. Well, hey, Carly. Thanks for having me on your show once again. You know, it's always a pleasure to be here. Oh, so, I love having you on. You bet. So this, this time I was in the local home improvement center. You know, I, where I live in small town America, Saturday morning, that's home improvement day, right? So you're going to rush to the home improvement center. You're going to get all of your materials. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. You're going to get your materials. You're going to get them in your truck. You're going home and you're going to make some stuff happen, right? So it's high energy. Everybody's having fun. Person's having fun the most is the guy at the building desk at the local home improvement center. Wonderful guy. I've known him for years and he's just killing it with the customers. I'm about four or five in line and he's laughing. He's joking. Everything is great until the big jerk of a customer comes in and he's just angry because he had special ordered this door. He had been to customer service and they told him, hey, special orders aren't returnable. So he walks up to the guy at the counter and he's, you're going to take this back no matter what. And the guy was really nice, you know, and he says, hey, I understand you're upset. I get that. Unfortunately, special order doors aren't returnable because we can't do anything with them. And, you know, he's real nice about it and he explained, you know, hey, when you special ordered the door, you signed a paper that said, hey, special orders aren't returnable. And anybody that's ever been to the local Home Depot or the, the, the local Home Improvement Center or even the local lumberyard knows that. I don't know if you've ever special ordered construction equipment, but they're really clear about it, especially at this place. I go there all the time. So, you know, I'm thinking, what are we going to do here? And the guy says, you will get me a manager. So, you know, just like he's supposed to do, he gets on the walkie-talkie and he calls the manager over. The manager says he'll be right here. And he turns to the customer and politely says, you know what, hey, my manager will be right over. He'll be happy to speak with you. Right, so as the manager walks up, I see, wow, one of my favorite people, one of my best friends, a guy I've known from town all the time, just happens to be the manager that they call. And I'm like, cool. Doc's going to handle this just amazingly. This is going to go really well. Right, because I'm feeling bad for the guy on the other side of the counter. The customer was not nice. And before the manager even gets up to the counter, the customer jumps all over him, talking about what a great customer he is and how he's going to go do his business elsewhere, da-da-da-da-da. And, of course, I'm laughing inside because there's nowhere else to do your business. You can make all the threats that you want to, but I live up in the north woods of Wisconsin. I mean, if he's going to do his business elsewhere, he's driving 50, 60 miles because it's, Saturday and not a lot of people are open where we live you know in the independent hardware industry or if they are they're not open very long and besides that they're not gonna be able to give him his door <laughs> I mean because they can't take the money back for a door he bought from somewhere else so anyway I'm sitting there thinking okay my buddy's got this and the customer starts harping on him and my buddy does something that I just couldn't believe everybody in retail hates this phrase he goes well I'll tell you what just this one time, we'll take this thing back right in front of the employee that went ahead and told the customer that he couldn't take it back. Oh, and by the way, the customer starts out with the manager saying how the employee was really rude to him. Now, as you well know, I'm a pharmacy manager for a large company, and I hear that all the time. Oftentimes, the customer says to me, your employee was really rude. And that's code for, your employee didn't give me what I want. And he wasn't rude. So by going ahead and saying, we'll do it just this one time, he totally disempowered the employee, just ran him right over. And then, of course, he does what all chicken-hearted people do. He says to the employees, so get him his refund, and then he exits the scene. Now what was really sad then is the customer then is all smug. It was almost so much it made you want to throw up. And he was all like, see, I told you so. I get my way. And the poor guy has to wait on him now and get him his money. And he gave the customer the money. Now remember, I'm third or fourth in line. And I watch this guy now treat every customer that is between me and him 
with an extreme, how do you want to say it, edge to him? Very surly, very curt. He wasn't dispolite, but he wasn't polite, and he certainly wasn't the same guy who was standing there 10 minutes earlier. So I wrote this blog about, well, what are you doing? What story are you telling to your customers, to your employees? Because to me, that employee is his most important customer. Wouldn't you say? What did I say? I said, wouldn't you say that oh, yeah, your absolutely. employees are your most so, important customer? We, we were talking before we got on, as you and I always do, and I said there was two things that he he'd done wrong. First of all, not only did he diss his employee, but first of all, he, he could have done two things very differently. One is he could have taken the unhappy customer to a completely different area of the store. You know, let's have a, you know, I'm really sorry you're dissatisfied. Let's come to my office and discuss this. So first of all, he wasn't, you know, uh, doing this in front of his employee, which, like you said, it is his most valuable asset, okay? So he's not dishonoring his employee in front of a group of people. And he did it in front of his customers, which was even worse. So now he's sending the message to the customers, oh, by the way, I don't honor you either, and he's saying the message to the other customers, you, by the way, can also come back and return something, which, by the way, is in our policy. So, A, he's not honoring the company's policy, which is, by the way, if you order something that is, is custom, um, you can just roll over us and come return it. Because I don't, it's not even a lumber yard. Anywhere you go, any store, if it's a custom order, you sign something saying you can't return, even if it's clothing. I mean, I don't care what, what brand or, you know, uh, store it is, every, every store cross range has that customer uh, policy when it's something as a custom order, right? So, so he basically ran over the customer um, in various ways because he basically in front of everybody said, by the way, I'm not honoring the company's policy of custom orders you cannot return. He did it in front of all the other customers. So he, like I said, he could have taken the customer to his office and said, hey, I'm really sorry you're not happy with our service. Let's come to my office and have this discussion. And two, like you said, he totally discounted his employee in front of not just the employee, but in front of all the others. So, I mean, he did many, many things wrong there. And, um, and of course, the employee is going to have a different attitude because, you know, he just got completely run over in front of everybody and embarrassed. So it's like, you know. Yeah, and then several interesting things happened after that. Right after it happened, the guy behind me whispers into my ear, what a weasel. He said, everybody knows that we'll do it just one time is code for I don't have the guts to stand up for myself. And I thought to myself, or for my employee. So I thought that was interesting because I thought if the guy behind me thinks he's a weasel, what does his employee think? And then another thing that was really interesting is as I'm walking out of the store, you know, I go and I get my stuff and I'm starting to walk out and I see the manager talking to a cashier. He's helping her with something. And we sort of make that cross the room eye contact and his eyes immediately go down. So in other words, he made me feel like he knew he had done something wrong. But well, here's the sure. thing. I'm sure as you're, as, and, you know, as a friendship that he'd had with you, I'm sure in his eyes he knew that in some way you were disappointed in him. And the other added piece to that, imagine now those customers that were in line, what stories do you think they're telling to their friends? And I'm going to add another piece to this. Social media. Do you know how many people now will go on social media and actually tweet out stories about that company? I've seen this, and, that, and that's what people don't get about online reputation management. With the onset of social media, like you know, people when they check in on Foursquare, when they go to a restaurant to say I had a really great experience about this restaurant, I had a really bad experience about this website, Yelp, when you go on Yelp you can write reviews about stores, um, you know, restaurants, etc. Twitter is, I've actually known people that have had a bad experience on a flight and have actually tweeted out, this was the most horrific blah 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 because I got, you know, uh, uh, bumped off the flight even though I had reserved blah blah and immediately gotten responses immediately because now they have customer services teams looking on Twitter, Twitter, Yelp and Foursquare immediately seeing if people are actually putting bad reviews so they can immediately respond. Know that people are actually doing this. So if you have a manager doing something like this, they need to be aware that people are now going on these services and putting up stuff like you know Beware, don't go to this place because 
there's a manager that will do this or you know customer service is really bad here people need to be smarter when they're serving their customers because you will get a bad rap I see it all the time now and they're stupid to do this in their stores because it will come back to bite you well and, and that's really I think the key point behind the whole blog is why did he do it and I believe it's that he was telling himself two particular stories and I believe both stories are lousy first story is the customer is always right well that would be true if there's only one customer he's got multiple customers going on number one he's got the guy who's upset and I I understand that guy put him in a tough spot but he's also got another customer who's his employee he's got the four or five or six of us who are in line and he's also got himself how do you go through life influencing and leading other people when you do things that intentionally undermine your self-respect so he's telling himself that story the customer is always right aren't they but more importantly he's telling himself another story and you're kind of alluding to this and this is what's interesting he does not want this customer calling corporate because then corporate's gonna know that he made that customer unhappy so what that presupposes is that he's gonna call corporate and corporate's gonna get mad at him or put him in trouble so shame on corporate for making him feel like that in the first place right because corporate will then forward that email back to him and saying what are you going to do about this and he knows that I think that's par too prevalent so in a, in a sense he's afraid that corporate's gonna do to him what he did to his guy but I want to tell you something and I think this is really important that's very short-sighted thinking because what happens is the person that's gonna cost him the most customers is that employee number one the employee is not engaged anymore and he's not treating the people in front of him but do you think he's not going back to the break room and saying hey do you know what Josh did to me and now he's gonna you know have a really bad attitude towards management he's spreading that attitude like a virus like you said he's going out on Facebook and tweeting to his or printing to his friends and Twitter and tweeting to his friends man the place I work for this is what happens so I think it's interesting that he's telling himself this story that he's doing the right thing but that story is very short-sighted and I'll give you a different example like you well know my wife is a marathon running maniac and you know that she's out running early in the morning and you know that because of that other people are criticizing me for quote unquote letting her like I'm like I have a voice but you know I had to come to terms with that right do you know what the number one killer of women is heart disease right so when you're weighing risks against each other risk number one is that she's attacked by a bear or a stranger or there's risk number two heart attack diabetes these kind of things obviously running goes a long ways towards preventing that so you're weighing risks against each other and really even though there's an emotional feeling that a bear is dangerous the reality is that her long-term risk is a heart attack right so how does that apply when you take that short-term fix and fix that one customer but you sacrifice your employee relations, you fact sacrifice your other customer relations, you sacrifice your self-esteem, you're actually making a greater impact on your business. And that's when corporate's really going to come back to you and say, well, I don't understand why sales are down 15% in your store this week. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And furthermore, I always get crazy when people get wrapped up in other people's business because, first of all, they don't know Tanya. And they don't know, first of all, that she's also a nurse. So it's like, hello, right? So, I mean, you know, let's, let's put that all aside. But I'm going to go to the other side because we're talking about Twitter. I was also talking about the customers tweeting about their experience. And here's the step further that the, your, your friend, who's the manager at the store, hasn't gone to take courses on. How do you handle angry customers? He could have actually flipped that customer to be a very happy customer. Go take courses on negotiations. Go learn some NLP, Neuro Linguistics Reprogramming. You can t go read, um, you know, there's some fabulous books out there on reframing people who could be the most angriest, pissed off customer, and you can actually have them actually being happy. I mean, there, there are lots of ways to handle people that are actually spewing venom. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. And, and get their level of voices down and actually not having a screaming argument. Um, 
I can give you, you and I both know an author who just wrote a book, Adversaries into Alleys. Bob Berg's book has amazing reframing, amazing tools in there that can teach people how to handle people like him. Okay, so there's amazing books out there, and I can there's I mean there's a lot of books out there that will teach managers how to handle. You yourself have taken courses, and you yourself deal with angry customers at your company and where you work that come up and scream at you daily. That actually scream at your employees that your employees when they're almost at a breakdown or crying point that you come in to rescue them and say, well wait a minute. I mean, how many times have you had people up at your customer window screaming bloody murder because, you know, this, that, or other happened and you've had to talk them off the ledge? How do you handle it? You know, you, you deal with it all the time. So it's not for lack of being able to handle the situation. It's for lack of knowledge and learning the skills and tools on how to deal with angry customers. Can I share with you what the number one book that helps people do that correctly is? And I bet this is going to surprise you, but it's called The Secret. Because you get what you think about and you get what you attract. Oh, so here's, what's, here's what happens. He walks up with this fear-like energy, so he gets hostility. Instead of walking up with confidence, with kindness, with, hey, let's really work this out in a way that works for everybody, he radiates this nervous energy. He doesn't think through what he really wants from this interaction and he gets essentially what he deserves. And do you know what happens? As you were kind of alluding to, he develops a reputation. And what happens in these places, and this really, really happens, I've been working in corporate America for 25 years and I've seen this. I, not only are they asking for the manager now the next time they go in, I want to talk to Josh. Josh will give me what I want because he knows I'm going to chew his butt if he doesn't. And that's what they're thinking. Is that really the kind of customer you want to do business with? Is that really the kind of customer you want asking for you? Obviously not. And I want to tell you how I learned that. And this may sound a little bit rude, but when I was very first working in the town I was working in, I was hired to come into a pharmacy that was added to a major department store. right? And they didn't do a very good job of advertising. So we started literally with six prescriptions a day. I would stand there from nine in the morning to nine at night and I would get six prescriptions a day. So I got to know the customers very, very well because I could fill six prescriptions in about 15 minutes. So now I got 11 hours and 45 minutes to kill. And what would happen is you, you'd really get to know these people intricately and after a few months would go by, you always knew, like you could tell when they were coming up what you were going to get. And I always had this guy, his name was Clarence, and Clarence would always yell at me and say, I'm a good customer here. You'd pull up his profile, and Clarence spent in the last year about $17 a month. Versus they had this other guy called Rufus, who, and Clarence was tough to deal with. Clarence was a pain in the neck. I never thought of him as a good customer, but he was sure he was. Now I had this other guy named Rufus who would come in and laugh and smile and joke but Rufus had rheumatoid arthritis and he would spend around seventeen hundred dollars a month and he was just a joy to deal with. So what I learned is that the customers may have that perspective that hey I'm a good customer here but it's up to us to decide who do we really want to do business with and how do we want to do business. And what happens is that customers whether they know this or not want to do business with people that they respect. I used to have a guy that worked with directly with me and I felt so bad for him because he was so wishy-washy that when a customer would demand, say that he gave them a few controlled substance pills to get through until they could get their refill authorized by the doctor, then he would do it. And, and what would happen is that's totally, totally against the law, but he would do it out of fear or something and I would just look at him and say, no, you know the law as well as I do. Here's my options. I've called the ER and the doctor says no. I've called the doctor on call and he said no. Here's what you can do. And no, I mean, I, most of the time, as you well know, I'm going to do everything in my power to get your issue taken care of, but I'm not going to break the law. And so what happened is that those same customers, though, when they had a serious problem, they would call me and say, okay, what do you think I should do? Why? Because I wasn't wishy-washy, because I wasn't afraid of my own shadow, and because I would commit. You ever ask somebody for their opinion and they're all, well, I don't know, you know. I mean, you're an expert, Carly, on committing. 
I don't wonder what you're thinking. And I love talking to you because of that. Because I know that if I ask you a question just the other night, I said, and I think this is funny, Carly, what do you think about my website? <laughs> I not only got your opinion, I got a paragraph supporting your opinion. So now I have an opinion I can respect, and I have an opinion that I can do something about. I can either reject it or accept it, but I can do something about it. But if you were like, well, I don't know, it kind of looks okay to me, but I was, I don't, you know, I can't do anything with that. Right? And management is the same way. When you're dealing with people, they need to know what you're made of. And your employees need to know that you're made of something so that they have some place to work. In other words, if the employee is standing there going, well, I don't know if I can take care of this door. I don't know if I can take it back because one manager says I can't, one manager says I can't. They're stuck. Do you know that I actually was trained, you talked about taking classes and reading books and so forth. I was actually trained that it's better to be a jerk as a manager if you're a jerk all the time than it is to be a jerk some days and really nice others. You believe that, don't you? Well, absolutely. And unfortunately, you know, I think that it's, it, well, here's the thing. And I think you'll agree with this. I think some people think, okay, we have the freedom of speech. So everyone can just say whatever they want how they want. I think there's a way to be honest and not be an a-hole about it. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm serious, okay? It's like, you know, I was honest with you about the new design, right? I was honest about it, and, and I gave you the exact reasons why, right? So I, I was honest you. without being an a-hole about it, right? So it's Correct. like a lot of people think, well, there's freedom of speech. So I can just say you're an a-hole, right? It's like, well, why? Why do you have to, why do you have to be honest and curse? It's like, can you not be honest and not curse? It's like, <laughs> if we have freedom of speech doesn't mean we get to steamroll someone. Well, you know, Thumper's dad said it this way. A lot said, of people hide behind the Freedom of Speech Act. And I think that, to me, is BS. I'm sorry. Just because we have freedom of speech doesn't mean we get to steamroll people. It's like there's a way to be honest and not be, you know, an ass about it. I'm sorry. So, I mean, that's my opinion about that. I think we can be, and that's why, I don't know, um, I think, who I forget who was saying this. We, a lot of people say, um, I can, um, I'm of the opinion of being brutally honest. Well, okay, does the word brutally have to be in there? <laughs> well, you know, there's such a thing as, as no, there's really no upside to being a jerk. There's absolutely no upside. Because you know what, Carly? I don't care how smart you are. I only care how smart I am. If I'm a, if I'm a regular person walking around, Bob Berg said it great. They don't care about your story until they s know that you care about theirs. And here's the thing. You ever do, like, we, talked, we started this talking about home improvement project, right? So you finish your basement. You do this incredible work. You put all this time, effort, and money. And then you invite, let's say, your uncle over. And he comes over and he finds the one thing to criticize versus the 99 things to compliment you about. Well, as soon as he picks that one thing to criticize, you don't like him anymore. So you can be honest. You do have the freedom of speech, but why would you use it? You know, I go into the Subway restaurant in the store that I work, and I, I, I say things like, can you please make a sandwich for me that consists of this? And I'll tell you what, those people, they put extra meat, they put extra vegetables, they stack that sucker really high because I'm nice to them. I'm not doing anything difficult, I'm just nice to them. Now I watch a guy who's a jerk to my employees go down to Subway one day and it was really interesting because he starts yelling at the girl about the kind of lettuce that they use. Note. I went back and I said to my girls, I said, good wait, wait, Note. Note. It, it follows. If, now, here's the thing. It's the same thing. People are saying money is evil. Money only makes you more of what you already are. Just like the guy who's a jerk to your, your customers, he's the same jerk everywhere. That's what people don't get. If you're a jerk in one place, this, you're going to be the same jerk outside. So he's a jerk to your customers. He's a jerk to the people at Subway. It's well, yeah, and it's like everywhere. And that's exactly right. Because I go back to, to my area and I say, hey, guess what? Here's the good news. I just saw Mr. X at Subway, and they all know him. I said, guess what? He's a jerk to everybody. 
<laughs> you, you know, so it's not you. Because the big problem is it's really hard to get through the rest of your day and not take it personally when these people come along and they just jump on your case. And what I don't get, and I, I, I've thought about this a lot, is why? I mean, I realize you're unhappy and I realize, but there's no way to get happy if you're walking around miserable all the time. Well, I, I loved your thing where you're, you you came out of a new store. Oh, by the way, I need to put a little disclaimer in here. Know that when we're mentioning a lot of different people's names, we are we are not giving you exact people's names because we do change people's names. We're not saying, you know, because, you know, obviously that wouldn't be correct to use people's real names here. So yeah, that, 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 that goes without saying. There's definitely... I just want to put that out there. So if you hear people's names being thrown out there, we have switched people's names. Um, but I, I loved it when you came and told me you went to work at a different uh, uh, location the other day, and they, they told you you were too happy. I love that. I mean, it's like, I, I love it. I guess we're supposed to be miserable. It's like you can't work and be happy. If you're working, you're supposed to be miserable. I get that all the time too. People are telling me, you know, because you know my story. You know, I've had 29 surgeries, and they're like, when I had one of my last surgeries, and um, someone saw me, and I was walking like right after I had my my knee replaced, and you know, obviously I had the staples in it and everything, and I had a meeting like you know days after, and they're like, I don't get it. Like you know, you're, you're in massive pain. Why are you smiling? Like, you're, you're like, and, and it's like, it's, you know, mind over matter. You have to put your mind in the place that you're in. I'm not gonna spew anger and my pain or whatever I'm feeling on someone else. I'm not going to project. And so it's like you have to be, you have to do whatever you have to do to put your mind in where you need to be. And I don't understand, you know, people, so they're always saying to me, I'm too positive. I don't know. It's like, no, occasionally I have, you know, I'm human. Do I have my meltdowns? Yes. Do you have a fight with Tanya now and again? Yes. Do you have problems with your son now and again? Yes. We're all human. We all have our meltdowns. We all have our moods. We all have our, you know, days that we are depressed or whatever. But does not does it not make us still, um, you know, positive people? Our generality beings of who we are, right? Yes. Um, but do we still have our issues? Absolutely. But and, um, you know, does it? I, I love it when you and I, or even other people that are in our circles, where we're told we're either too happy or too positive, or that we're in dreamland, or um, you know these type of things. We just actively choose to practice, um, you know, keeping our minds in a more positive perspective, so that um, we're, we don't keep the majority of our lives in the negative aspect. If that makes sense. Oh yeah, back to the law of attraction. You know, there is something that literally happens to me when I get out of the car in the parking lot where I work. You mentioned it. You know, there are times when, as happily married as I am, there are times where, ooh, I didn't need that going out the door. But there's something that happens to me as I'm walking across the parking lot. I know that it's my choice as to who walks through that workplace door. And I know that if I go in there with a bad attitude and an angry attitude and a condescending attitude and you name it attitude, my day is going to be ten times harder. I know, conversely, the late Stephen Covey said it this way, that you can't control what happens to you, but you can control the space between stimulus and response. In other words, Carly, you can say anything to me right now and it's up to me to choose my response. Because there is a lag time between when you say it and when I respond. My job is to lengthen that lag time and say something intelligent, something meaningful, something useful, or something kind. And what I, what I, what I want people to understand is in the world of leadership, in the world of what I call customer service reinvention, it's up to us to understand that what you bring to the table is essentially what you're taking away from the table. And I've watched this, I can't tell you how many times, where the, one of my own employees will say, I don't understand why he yelled at me. And I'll want to say, I won't say it this way, but I'll think it. Well, he walked up with a fire and you threw gasoline on it. So now let's talk about how we don't do that. And you mentioned some of the ways already. Let's go to a place where it's just you and us, or just you and I, so we can go ahead and put some sort of control on an out-of-control situation. Oftentimes what I say is, hey, 
you know what, you've got a tough situation here, Carly, and I, I'll get this a lot of times. You just leave from the pharmacy, right? You just spent $300. Your doc, you get home, your doctor's got an answering machine message that says, oh, your lab tests show we should take you off that medicine. Well, technically and legally, that medicine is not returnable. So I can do one of two things. I can say, Carly, that's not returnable. Go call someone who cares. Or I can say, I'll tell you what, Carly, you've got a tough situation. Let me take down your phone number. Let me think about it a little bit. Let me call my supervisor for guidance, and I'll get back to you. So that even if the answer ultimately turns out to be no, which it almost never is, I almost always can find a mutual solution that works for both of us, maybe in terms of a store credit or sometimes we'll just give them their money and tell them to keep the product you know for goodwill you know because we're talking about we want to keep our customers for a lifetime and we don't want to create a lifetime scar over a single event but why isn't it okay to say hey it's a tough situation let me mull it over and get back to you I think that really shows the customer that I care enough to check it out and of course that presupposes that I'm going to follow up and I think one of the big challenges these days is everybody's so busy and everybody's so understaffed that one of the biggest mistakes we make in customer service is showing an attitude of indifference by not following up, by exactly. not getting back to them. Exactly. Most people will just say, you know, want to do the fight because they don't want to go the extra step. It's too much work. It's a problem. And, and that's the biggest thing. And, and unfortunately, a lot of companies nowadays are cutting down, you know, understaffing, which makes it a lot of lot more work for the people that are working these days. So, and when I want to say what you said about the lag time, the biggest phrase to remember is respond, not react. Respond, not react. People need to remember that phrase. That's the biggest thing. You don't want to react. You want to respond. And that lag time is giving you the time to relax, breathe, so you don't react. If you automatically blurt something out, you're reacting. Take that <laughs> lag time to breathe, think, then respond. But if you're automatically re you know, blurting out, you're actually in defensive mode and you're reacting. You are not responding. One of my tests that I use for that is I immediately have the thought that if I wouldn't say it to my grandmother, I'm not saying it to the customer. Or to your child. That's a big one. Think about how you how you would treat your child because that's a big one. If you're not going to say it to your own child, and if you don't have a child, the grandmother or grandparent works really, really well because not everyone has a child. But I always think about it, you know, your child. Would you say it to your child? Well, so you know, child or grandparent, that's a good one. I think those are two really good analogies. I'm really glad you mentioned that because of, of all, my son Christopher is 11 and he's one of the, he's just a great kid. And one of the very few things I remember about his younger childhood is when I didn't do what you just said. He, we had gotten a new puppy, he was about five years old, and he was only five years old, and he made her squeal. And I, I was, and I, I felt that he did it out of meanness, and I said something to the effect of, you go upstairs, I don't even want to look at you right now. And this kid turns back to me with tears in his eyes, and he says, I don't want to look at you either. I can't relive that moment over and do it again right. So it's up to me going forward to take responsibility for the fact that, hey, I screwed that up, and to promise myself that next time, I'm going to do whatever it takes to lengthen that gap so that I respond and don't react. I think it's so important that you you got to realize is that you got to almost talk to the person of yourself that lives in the future. My friend Steve Olsher said this to me when I was at his certification class. He said, "Look, talk to the Corey in the future and say, how are you going to feel if I do this right now in this moment?" Great example he gave is, you know, is the Corey in the future, four years from now, going to be really happy that you made a five-year contract on an auto loan today? Talk to him. Instead, we want to talk to the Carly of the past. Carly, why did you do it this way? Right? So if we get better at talking to the Carly of the future and saying, 
if I respond or react this way, how am I going to feel in 30 days, in 60 days, or sometimes in a lifetime? Critical, huh? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty amazing way to look at it. Well, Corey, I know you and I could always talk for, I don't know, a long time. <laughs> but we always want to give, we don't want to make it too long so people can really absorb the information. So what are some last great nuggets of wisdom you can leave the audience with on this subject? Well, you know, one of the things that I teach is that we really have to do a better job of defining who our customers are. And I define a customer as anyone we have the opportunity to add value to. Thereby, our employees are customers, our customers are obviously customers, but our family members are customers, and even the person who makes my sandwich at Subway. So that we should always treat people with the same kind of customer service and respect that we would treat our most valuable paying customers. So in this particular case that we've been discussing, it was really important that the manager understood that the employee was probably the more important customer of the two, and also that there's always an alternative that doesn't involve sacrificing your self-respect and your employees. Slow it down, take your time, do whatever you have to do to diffuse the situation, but don't automatically react and do something you'll regret later. And where can people find you? Because now you have a wonderful new website. And so um, I'd love for you to spell that out since some people are actually listening to this and not watching this. Well, I have two places that I like people to find me. The first place is Corey, C-O-R-E-Y, Janky, J-A-H-N-K-E dot com. And for those people that are really struggling with anxiety, fear, and depression, the free ebook dot com is a great place to register for my free ebook that talks about the seven ways that you can get your emotional intelligence and your social intelligence under control so that you can feel better and live the life that you were meant to live that what I call the prescription for sanity and you have something exciting coming out don't you you're working on um, a new book I hear oh yeah we're really really excited is it the proofreader and one of my favorite mentors just gave me a tremendous endorsement for it. It's called What a Lousy Story. And it is about exactly what we're talking about. You can tell yourself one story, but you're telling other people a different story by the way you act. I'm really excited. It's called What a Lousy Story. I expect it to be out within the next six weeks. Awesome. And meanwhile, you still have the, um, the, the free ebook. That's still available, right? Yep, at thefreeebook.com. Awesome. That's the As best way to get started getting to know me. Oh, absolutely. As everybody in my audience knows, I put together a wonderful blog post which will have all of Corey's information as well as the link to the free ebook. And it'll have the embedded podcast as well as the embedded video and all of his wonderful nuggets. It's been such a wonderful joy having Corey with me once again. It has been a while this time. Usually we attempt to get together every other month. However, we've both been very busy. So I look forward to seeing everybody next week. And thank you once again, Corey. It's been such a joy. Thank you, my friend. I've really enjoyed it. Absolutely. And I shall see everybody next week. So have a wonderful weekend. It is the weekend right now. And I'll see everybody next week. Goodbye for now.